All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so in this station, you're going to have, uh, we've got Dr. Arnold talk a little bit about poisonous weeds that are out in the pasture, and then we'll have uh, Dr. Green come in right after that and talk about prevention and weed control. Sounds good. If you could give me about a five-minute heads up when the time's almost up. So good morning. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, not just weeds but also some trees because I wanted to hit the things that, are, that we see most frequently at the diagnostic lab. And probably the number one poisoning we see uh, year after year is this Japanese yew or taxus bushes because it's such a common uh, landscape plant and lots of people go and, they, and they, the way it grows you get those little shoots that grow up and everybody wants to go out and trim those off so um, and they think they're doing doing you a favor by throwing it over the fence to to your cattle so it doesn't take very much of this this plant to cause death um, it's a it's cardiotoxic to the heart and what it actually does is interferes with the electrical conductivity in the heart so they have a heart block and heart failure very quickly it's usually within minutes of, of um, consuming enough so approximately one to five pounds is enough to kill an 1100 pound cow and that's really not very much for green material um, dependent on the toxicity and this is true of all of these toxins it really depends on the stage of growth as to how much of the toxins actually in there it's usually a, like a chemical and in this case is a cardiotoxic what we call a taxine so it all depends on the concentration of that and it depends on how much they eat so always remember the dose makes the poison you know a small dose is not going to be uh, fatal. A lot of times they don't even have signs, but a big dose or a lethal dose is another story. So we, <clears throat> as far as diagnostics on, on Japanese U, we can typically find these needles in the rumen contents. They die so quickly, there's no processing of this, um, of this plant, so we can find the, actually find the needles in there. Another um, very common toxicity we see um, this time of year getting into it is buckeye buckeye and horse chestnut the the fruits are toxic the the seed covering is is um is poisonous as well as the leaves and the buds in the spring so this one is um this one is a neurologic agent so if you see a buckeye uh, an animal that eats buckeye you're going to see much more of the staggering uh, strange gait and a lot of people talk about they'll actually do somersaults They'll actually just flip over because they have no balance whatsoever. Um, doesn't take a lot to do uh, to um, be a, uh, to be toxic. Five pounds for a 500-pound calf. Anybody that's fooled with buckeyes, it doesn't take a lot of buckeyes to make five pounds. I mean, that's that's uh, not not a whole lot. And we can actually find these in the um, rumen contents. You know, open up the rumen. You see the buckeyes there, but we also had a case, um, I think it was two years ago, where the producer had a watering trough underneath, underneath or close by the buckeye tree. And the buckeyes actually fell down into the watering trough and that, that um, toxic agent came out into the water. And they drank the water, showed all the classic signs of, of buckeye toxicity, but we couldn't find any buckeyes. And then you know, got to talking to him said, are there no buckeye trees anywhere? And he said, well, yeah, there's one right next to the watering trough. So went out there and looked and it was full, full of those. So, so be careful of that. Another one um, that them has fallen off or, um, or a tree has actually fallen. Once those leaves wilt, then you got the, the chance of having cyanide poisoning. So cyanide, again, is one of those very quick or prussic acid is another term people use. Very quick death. It's just starving the cells for oxygen. You know, they can't, that, that, the hemoglobin can't release oxygen to the tissues. So that's another one that goes very quickly. One that, that we sometimes see in the fall, but not terribly often, is, is um, oak toxicity from, from consuming acorns. Um, usually happens when feed is scarce so hopefully this year we're not going to see that but they'll eat acorns over several days you know they really um, consume quite a few 
very characteristic signs here in that they tend to develop the urine gets a, a strange color it's either dark colored or or some blood in it they usually get diarrhea that's that's really black and tarry um, and then they'll eventually die from kidney failure so if you see, I mean, and, and believe me, there are some that get a taste for, for acorns and you can't hardly keep them out of there. But <clears throat> and this typically happens in younger animals. And the adult cows can most of the time handle the, the, the gallotannins in here, but the younger animals can't. So if you see that, you know, this may be a situation where you have to either move them out of, out of the field or fence, fence the woods off until the deer finally get rid of those. So going to toxic weeds, um, are all of our favorite weed, poison hemlock, that's absolutely everywhere. Um, <clears throat> now it seems to have taken over, and uh, Dr. Green's going to talk about the best time to spray for this, for this plant. Um, poison hemlock has a, a neuromuscular blocker that in there. So the immediate signs are going to be um, kind of a, an excitement, and then it goes more to a depression. So um, they go, and then they start to weakness and staggering. Um, one of the things that you might notice is the breath and the urine of the cow smell like mouse urine. You know, it's the same smell as that poison hemlock has. So, um, and they die from respiratory paralysis. The times we see poison hemlock poisoning are uh, most of the time dry lot animals that finally get loose. For one reason or another, they get out into a place that's really grown up with poison hemlock and boy, they'll strip it all the way down to the ground. <clears throat> if they survive this, I mean, they, they can survive it. Uh, they usually don't have any ill effects later on. There are no lasting effects, but uh, many of them die from respiratory failure. Only takes about 0.2 to 0.5 percent of body weight that's in green material to be fatal. And again, it all depends on the stage of the plant uh, as far as how toxic it is. One thing that <clears throat> we probably are unaware of, or most are unaware of, this has a teratogenic agent in it. So if it's consumed by a cow during her first trimester of pregnancy, then um, the calf can develop deformities. So this would be, you know, if you have fall calving cows, and this is where we see it uh, mostly, is they'll, they'll consume, consume this when it's really small. You know, it's one of the few things that stays green uh, during the winter and, and early, early spring. This is one of the first things to green up. So they consume it <clears throat> during that first trimester. The calf can be born with a deformed crooked spine, crooked neck, um, we also see um, down the crooked legs, not just crooked, but they're actually frozen that way. So the calf can't, you, you can't move, can't move the joints at all. And cleft palate is another thing that, that you might, um, might see from poison hemlock. So it's a good thing to get rid of if you can. Uh, and we actually see quite a few of these calves come into the lab and because they're so odd. You know, they think uh, there's some kind of poison. What is it that's done this? and it was the hemlock. Perillament is another bad one. We typically see this time of year. This year's not been an issue, at least in our part of the world, because it's been so wet. We've been, we've been wet and um, lots to graze, so they're really not picking at weeds very much this year, thankfully. This purple man or perillament grows in the shady areas and typically around in fence rows and along the woods. So if the cattle spend a lot of time in the shade, that's when they're going to go over and start eating on it. And um, when it gets to this stage where you've got the seeds, that's when it's most toxic. Um, <clears throat> and when they eat it immediately, that is, there's a perilla, what we call a perilla ketone. It gets absorbed into the bloodstream, goes to the lungs, and causes severe damage to the lungs. So they're going to look like a pneumonia case, they're, but it's called... It's called acute respiratory distress syndrome because they are struggling to breathe. They're stretched out. They've got their head stretched out. Their neck is stretched out. They're panting. You know, their shoulders are abducted. They're hunched up. They're just trying to move air <clears throat> because they're, the, the damage it's doing to the lungs. It's a, a very specific type of pneumonia called an interstitial pneumonia. 
when we open up the chest on necropsy, the lungs will, the lungs are normally deflated, and these animals they'll be completely full. They are completely full, fill the chest cavity, uh, lots of air, lots of big gas bubbles in the lungs, so they are struggling to move air. And this one, we can't do much or something if they are starting to pick around on weeds. This, yeah. Dr. Green's going to handle that one right after me. <laughs> He's doing the weed control. So really briefly, I want to mention these three just because they're, they're common. We see a lot of these in the pastures. Spiny amaranth, all our favorite, this, this pigweed, um, can cause two different syndromes. One is um, kidney, a kidney failure, and it's, it's kind of a progressive over time. You'll start to see weakness, I mean difficulty walking, some, um, some paralysis in the rear, kind of nonspecific signs. And that's true of nearly any toxic weed. They're going to be nonspecific. Um, just, just kind of usually a little bit of diarrhea. There's some GI irritation. And see um, weakness, trembling, staggering. It can be almost any weed presents like that. So, so that's why I say look to see are they nibbling on this. Because now and then you will get an animal that really likes this stuff. And they will just stay there and just keep nibbling, nibbling, nibbling on this um, pigweed and those are the ones that end up dying from, from some type of kidney damage. Jimson weed, um, won't hardly eat jimson weed unless there's nothing else to eat. Uh, it's kind of interesting, usually starts with a GI irritation like diarrhea, but if they get enough of it they'll actually get to where they're hallucinating. So you'll see them, you know, they, they, looking at things and maybe chewing at the air, just some really odd symptoms um, because it is a hallucinogen at a high enough dose. And then fi finally milkweed, generally won't eat milkweed unless there's nothing else to eat again, but it is um, toxic to the heart and uh, non-specific signs. You just, to identify this as a problem, you just have to see, go around and look, are they, are they eating on it? Good question, and as far most of these are still toxic in hay, you know that. Yeah, and, they, and that's a good question. She said, "Will they pick it out, or will they eat it?" Depends on how hungry they are. I think is is a, probably the best answer, because some, you know, oftentimes they won't. If there's plenty to eat and they can be selective, hey, they're not going to eat it. If they're competing to eat and it's cold and it's wet, they're going to eat whatever's in front of them and not be too picky. I'm, I'm a lot the same way. So, so how do you prevent it? How do you prevent these toxicities? And I get lots and lots of pictures. People send me pictures of weeds and I, I'm not that good at, at weed ID beyond the ones that are real common. So I always tell them you, know, you, you can't keep your cattle from eating toxic weeds. I mean you can't prevent all of it, but we can do a few things. Um, don't overgraze your pastures. That's when they're going to start looking for weeds. Animals, we usually avoid weeds as long as there's plenty of other things to eat. Um, sometimes not so much with this, with this Japanese yew. It seems like that's kind of a novelty. Throw it over the fence and they're going to go eat it, um, regardless of the fact they've got plenty to eat. Um, implement effective weed control, offer supplemental forage when pasture is limited. And you know, this one's important, thicken stands and improve your desirable forage, forages so they compete with these weeds. And that's a very important fact. You can, you can eliminate a lot of weeds by getting a good grass stand. Pastures should be checked for fallen cherry tree limbs after thunderstorms or excessively windy days. Fences near homes should be monitored for signs of dumping. If they, uh, they may put limbs and hedge trimmings over the fence. You know, every, they, they may not put anything toxic over at one time, but the next time they might get you. So I would always mention that. Hey, don't feed my cattle anything from your garden because a lot of things are toxic. And then strategically fencing off the woods certain times a year if necessary to prevent oak and buckeye problems. So, any questions on that? Yes, sir. On that cherry tree, mm -hmm. that leaves, mm -hmm. I say if a limb just falls fresh, how many hours does it have to lay there before it becomes non-toxic? Yeah, that's a very good question. I actually get that one a lot, and it's going to depend 
on several factors. One is what, what's the weather? You know, if it's cool and damp outside, it's going to be a while before that wilts to a point where, um, <clears throat> well, it's going to be a while before it dries to a point where it's not toxic anymore. I mean, cyanide's a gas. So as it dries, it's going to be given off. It's given off into the atmosphere. It's no longer toxic. But <clears throat> while it's still within that leaf, you know, that's when we still have problems. But if it's hot and dry, it's going to wilt quickly. You know, it's just... No, I don't think it's going to be that long. I, I don't think I would, I would, I would say, um, you know, wilting begins almost immediately. Unless, and, and sometimes it's just slower getting to the point of being dry. So, yeah, you want to get on them pretty quickly. And I don't want to alarm anybody. I mean, cattle have a way to detoxify cyanide. They can do with a certain amount. So if you have a limb down and you have 50 cows come over and eat a couple of leaves a piece, you know, you're not going to have a problem. <clears throat> the problem comes in when it's a big, large amount and a few, few cattle. And they get quite a bit. And then they can't, they can't handle it. Yes, sir. Is that for element always purple like that? I've got a lot of green stuff that yep. goes along the edge of the blue. It, it can be dark green as well. Dark green to purple. Mm -hmm. tall. Yep. It's pretty tall. Now, one more question. Yes, sir. If I've got a field of solid Johnson grass. Uh huh. And I read your article last month and I, I was kind of afraid to turn them in on it. Would you? I'm, I wouldn't be worried about, well, you all have had drier weather than we, than we have. Of course, up in Lexington, it's been really wet this year. And we have some tests you can do, some field tests, that you can take some leaves, chop them up, and test for nitrates if you're concerned. I don't think they have wilted. It's just solid Johnson. Yeah, well, you know, when it's really dry, the only, the only thing we worry about really is the, is the nitrates in there. The cyanide, not so much. Um, until it starts raining again, and then, then, and then you get that quick growth, and then you can have cyanide in the tips. So, you know, we, we've got quick, rapid field tests for both, nitrate and cyanide, if you're real concerned. Um, and I, I know the feeling, because I had the same thing with my cattle, and it's like, I don't really want to turn them out in there. And we didn't have the field tests at that point, so, you know, it's kind of a nice thing, at least you can quickly assess it and if you come up with one that's questionable then you can take a sample and send it to the lab and we can test for it. I just cut it for hay. That works. That works. You know, nitrates won't go away too much in hay. So you might want to test your hay after a month or so. Just make sure your nitrate level is low but the cyanide will be gone. Any other questions? Yes sir. I learned something in the last two years. Interesting, yeah, that's <laughs> absolutely. What about pine needles? How are the cattle's not supposed to be eating those either? Pine needles that are, are um, will cause abortion, most definitely. And then there's some, there's usually some irritation as well. They got the oils in there, so you can have some digestive irritation, but by far the worst problem is abortion okay. from pine needles. All right, I'll turn it over to, to Dr. Green. He will tell you how to get rid of these things. Okay. All right. Well, I'm assuming you, all of you are gathered around because you have weeds. Is that a good assumption? Yeah, on land, you got weeds. Ah, that's, that's a given. That's a given from Mother Nature, right? So I've got some general comments I want to make and share some, a little bit of research data with you. And a few of you have already had a few specific questions. I hope to wrap up enough time that we can address some of those if, if, we, if we can. But as we start talking about this, what impacts do weeds have on our forages? our graze pastures and hay fields. Why, why, what are we concerned about? 
What did it do? They use up space. They use up space, okay. <coughs> Pardon? They shade the grass. They can shade the grass. They're competitive. Pardon? Take nutrients out of the ground. They might rob us of nutrients out of the ground, right? And moisture. Anything else? <coughs> Very good. That did not make my list. <laughs> Although I noticed <clears throat> over here in this little poster over here, this is that yellow spring wildflower down there. That little buttercup, isn't that a pretty spring wildflower? No. And tall ironweed shown up in a few flower arrangements. <laughs> anyway, there's a variety of ways in which these plants can impact us. One is quantity of available forages. Because they're there and they're going to compete against the desirable forages we want to grow for our, for our animals, right? That's what it's about. Growing the forages to feed the animals to put on pounds. That's competition. Someone mentioned this, reduction in the area grazed. They can impede grazing even if you've got good grass and or clovers. I was on a farm in Montgomery County a couple days ago in an area where I've got a, little, a, a field study. And it was interesting, the county agent pointed out, he said, look how well they're grazing where you sprayed, and over areas where it's my, my control, where the untreated area where a lot of weeds were, there was a lot of good grass that just wasn't touched. So you could tell where they were grazing. They were selecting around those areas. And the other thing, ultimately, it can impact the stand life of the desirable forages, because they can crowd out and shade out the areas that we want to grow. Along with that, they reduce the quality and palatability. And sometimes the reason why we have some of the more prominent weeds that we have is because they're just plain not palatable. If we can get cattle to graze ironweed, we can produce a lot of biomass to graze. But they just don't touch that plant. And then others have thorns. And then you just heard a good discussion about we have to be always aware of these potentially poisonous plants. And Michelle covered that very well. But just a little one field trial I did a few years back up in Lewis County where we treated some strips with a herbicide and other strips were not treated and we went in and collected the biomass a year after we started the study to separate out what was weeds and what was the good grass to graze. And if just quickly go through this data here, and this is on a per dry weight basis equivalent, okay? So if you look at the graze on treated compared to the untreated area, <coughs> untreated area, the total biomass was not different on that area. And this is a year, one year after it was treated. Where is it at? Well, the forage grasses in the treated area was most of that. Whereas where we did not spray, it was half as much forage grasses. Where's the difference? It's in these two weeds, primarily tall iron weed which in ho and horse nettle, which were the two prominent weeds. There are a few other species out there. The iron weed was highly competitive, and this was a, what I consider a, a pretty heavy stand of iron weed. But this, this area right here, other than getting the herbicide treatment, there was nothing else added to increase the forage production. So the weeds can compete. The real question, and I don't have a good answer for it, is how many weeds do you need to reduce production? What did you spray that maybe you said and I didn't hear? It was graze on, graze on. And that was because we were tar targeting tall iron weed and the horse nettle. So having said that, what are the tools in the toolbox to control weeds? And I kind of group these in these main areas. One is cultural practices. And if you leave with one point here today is, and Michelle already said, or Dr. Arnold already said it, what we do to manage the areas to increase the productivity of the desirable species to me is at least 60, if not 70 percent of weed control. That's the grazing practices, that's 
Uh, other things that we can do to either reestablish, thicken up, and or maintain a healthy stand of grass. That's easier for me to say than do when we have a dry season, right? There's a lot of things we can do. Mechanical, that's mainly mowing. And that's a big tool that we use. And with a lot of groups that I've got a little more time, I usually ask the question is, but when do you mow? If you're mowing for weed control, before we produce, the, we're going to try to shortchange the ability of plants to reproduce. We have some herbicide options, and more and more people are using herbicides to control weeds in pastures. If I asked this question 25 years ago, few of you may be spraying thistles, and that was about it. But there's a little bit more of that done. I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. Biological control, it's where you have an outside agent. Uh, one that I quickly mentioned is if you're grazing goats, they certainly graze different than beef cattle or horses. So they can serve as a biological agent. Now on the th on musk thistle, there's actually a thistle head weevil that the insect eats out the seed. So that's one of the few successful biological things. And then I'll mention prevention as, as another one there. Is that grazed on clover? Yes. Absolutely. If you want to get rid of clover, I can tell you how to get rid of clover with most of those herbicides that, I, that we have available to us. In fact, here's a quick list of herbicides options we have available. And I wanted to kind of go through these because we've got a few additions that you may not have heard about yet that may or may not be different than what we already had. They basically boil down to five main one active ingredients. And I've got a couple more I want to put on here. 2,4-D goes a long way to control a lot of weeds that we have chemical-wise. There is a newer product called Freelix, which is 2,4-D, but it's a choline salt. It's a low volatile, the lowest volatile formulation we have. And I always get the question about what's the difference between an amine and an ester. The lowest volatile is is the choline salt, then the amine, and then the esters, although they call them low volatile esters, they are the most volatile. Meaning that they can get up and move away from the site of application, which we are very hesitant to recommend those in the mid midsummer applications because if you've got to be aware of your surroundings. Dicamba, we often primarily recommend dicamba tank mix or pre-mixed with 2,4-D things like Weed Master, Rifle D, but you can also some of use some of the new dicamba products of Labor for Pastures as well, like Ingenia or Extendamax. You've probably heard of Crossbow and Pasture Guard. It's basically Triclopure is the driver there. Crossbow has 2,4-D with it. Pasture Guard has Fluoxapure, and there's some little niche differences there. And then we have the aminopyrrolid-based products. We don't usually use Milestone by itself. This product first came out as Forefront. That is not on the market anymore, now being sold as it's grazed on next. And then you may have heard of Chaparral, which is amino pyrrolid with metsulfuron, which is in these herb the herbicides down here. Now, that's been the kind of the core of the products we've talked about in more recent years. But we now have a label for use of a product called Sharpen, which is a totally different chemistry. These herbicides up, but from here up, are synthetic oxen herbicides, growth regulators. Now metsulfuron's an ALS. This is a PPO type chemistry, totally different chemistry, and I hope we'll come back to it, is we don't have to be as concerned about vapor loss with it. Same with Permit, which is another ALS herbicide. So we do have some new products and we're just starting to learn a little bit about how we can use those and I'm going to show you some data in a minute. I'm going to primarily talk about three primary her uh, weeds here while I've got time. One is tall ironweed, which is, everybody seems to be dealing with tall ironweed. Is that a fair statement? And I think that one of the key questions that I need is how much do I need to have to really get serious about doing a, a big program to control it? I've already shown you some data. It is robbing you of forage production if you've got a very big population. But if you are, get to the point where you feel like you need to do something to the drastic, and this gentleman's already asked, does that treatment kill clover? That's a concern with those herbicides because they have activity on clover. Here's kind of my approach to tall iron weed control based upon several years of work that I've, I've worked on, on this particular weed. It's an integrated approach. I'm going to recommend that you first mow that pasture mid to late summer, basically July. 
We want to remove all that top growth that occurs earlier in the season. Remove that and force this plant to produce some new succulent growth. Also deplete some of its root reserves. And then when it gets that regrowth 12 to 20 inches tall, then we're going to make that herbicide application, this next this cold snap, because I think tall iron weed's pretty much done after we get this cold snap this weekend. So this, but this needs to be done back in the fall, and we need to do that at it or amino pyrrolid. So triclopure again is a pasture guard or crossbow, amino pyrrolids, grazon or forefront. And how I would separate those two is how soon did I want to put clover back into that field. Because not only will all those herbicides kill clover, but this one can hang around a little while and make it a little bit longer before we can be assured that we'll get a good clover stand. If you want to get the clover back in the next spring, then I would lean more towards these. Not that if we got this on early enough and get enough rainfall in the fall, uh, we might be able to do that. But that's something to always consider. So it's basically an 18 month process. And the success that I have had using this approach has been at least a 90% or 90-95% reduction in tall ironweed the year after treatment. Okay, that's tall ironweed. The other weeds I want to talk about is, and particularly one that I've gotten more questions about the last couple years, and particularly this summer, is common cockleburr. Any of you doing cockleburr this year? You probably have it year in and year out, right? But it's really been more prevalent, I think, this year that people have been aware of. What do we know about cockleburr? When does it grow? Hot and humid. In the summer. Now, it does like hot and humid. It likes moisture, too, though. It does better in wetter years than it does in drier years as far as its overall growth. All right? But it typically has a peak germination period in May, early June. That's when most of it germinates. That doesn't mean that there's some can germinate a little bit later. The other key thing about cockleburr in its life cycle is you can set your calendar as to when it reproduces seed. When does that happen? It just happened. It just happened. I was monitoring these plots in early August, and I was August 1, I could not, you could just barely tell it was starting the reproductive phase. <coughs> August 10th, they had the little buds, the flowers. It's not a real showy flower. And then by the end of August, the burrs were there. It's relatively quick, within a month. So it's a more defined period in which it grows, which is a key, I think, in providing the best control strategy for that particular plant. Well, I set up a study actually at the Woodford Research Farm this year that had some common cockleburr in this field as well as common ragweed. This is a field that they used in their winter feeding area. So where do you find most cockleburr? Where it gets a lot of heavy grazing in the winter months, whether it's around the barn lot or a pasture field that gets grazed heavily because that's another key part of these type of weeds is, I'm going to talk about uh, common ragweed in a minute, to me they're indicators where you have a lot of open bare ground. So what we looked at was weed master, grazon, pasture guard, and freelix, which are the group four or synthetic oxen herbicides. But I really was interested in how well does permit and sharpen work on cockleburr for control as well as just mowing. No herbicide. I wanted to mow and I wanted to time my mowing just at the time when I started seeing those buds of the cockleburr before the burrs were produced. That happened then for me in August 20th. So about mid-August is when that key time to get the mowing done because at that point in time I'm banking on the fact that that plant's not going to have enough time to regenerate enough growth to produce a lot more burrs. All right, so I'm just going to use mowing as a practice. 20 or 30 days after application, all my herbicide treatments did extremely well. So it killed the cockleburr that was there. That was applied in June, mid-June. Cockleburr was about six to eight inches tall. That's another key thing to keep in mind. 
We move out to 60 days after application or two months. The Weedmaster, the Grazon, and the Freelix, as well as the Sharpen, all were providing basically 100% control. We started seeing a few breaks in the permit and especially the pasture guard. And then at 90 days, basically the same story with our best three treatments being the Weedmaster, Grazon, and Sharpen. And also because the mowing was about 70% reduction in the, the, the biomass of the cockleburg that was there. And, and we're going to follow this through till next year. Now, what about ragweed? Well, ragweed. Part, you go away. Okay. Why didn't you use 2,4-D? I did. That's Freelex. Oh. What I'm looking at is that new formulation. So 2,4-D is Freelex, okay? <clears throat> All right. Now, common ragweed. Its life cycle, for the most part, mimics cockleburr. Now it has maybe a little bit later time when the seed are actually produced, but when did most people suffer from, hay, uh, from uh, ragweed allergies? In August, when the pollen's produced. That's when the plant's producing seed. Again, the key to this is understanding the life cycle of those two weeds. Same treatments, same plots, and you can see 30 days out, the Weed Master and Grazon looked real well, which didn't surprise me. Their Sharpen did, did very well. Whereas the 2,4-D, the pasture yard, the 2,4-D, and the permit was a little bit lower. Still did a pretty decent job, but not quite as well. And you move on out here to 90 days. Again, those three were the best, followed by pasture guard and Freelix. And the permit was the, certainly the weaker one. And then again, about 70% control by mowing. Now, that's part of the story. That's part of the story because I'm going to back up to 10 days or 11 days after we applied and give you a little bit of a feel for the differences in the type of chemistries that we're looking at here. Again, these are group four or synthetic oxen herbicides. They work very slow and they mostly control broadleaf weeds, have little or no activity on grasses. Although I picked up a little bit of what I called injury there whenever I rated this for injury, and that's mainly what I was looking for early on. On the other hand, with permit, this was a little bit of yellowing, chlorosis on the grass, and the sharpen was a burn. So there's a little bit of burn out of the sharpen on that, on that grass. Now when I went and made my second rating at 30 days, all that went away. There was no no, no impact on that. And here was my early se seasonal evaluations, particularly with Sharpen. It's a contact herbicide, so you see the activity real quick. Within a day, you're going to notice where you sprayed. In fact, these plots were brown. I would have to say that the percent of cockleburr and ragweed in these plots was 80% of the area. It was a heavy population of those two weeds. Whereas it took a little bit longer for, for these others to, to fully show the effect. All right. Anyway, we're trying to tease out a little bit how, where do these things fit? The other thing I want to mention about permit is uh, has a, one of its real strengths is nut sedge control. Yellow nut sedge specifically. Other sedges I'm not as sure about, but if you're dealing with nut sedge, that is now a tool that we could use there in grass pastures. The thing about Sharpen is it's not going to help you on the perennial weeds, though. It'll burn them back. In fact, it did burn back some Johnson grass, but it comes roaring right back because it doesn't translocate into the plant as much. It's mainly dealing with the contact activity on those leaves. And that's what we're seeing here with, the, with that activity. But the benefit of Sharpen is I'm real nervous about recommending any of those herbicides to spray in June and July and even early August. Hot, humid days. And if you've got sensitive vegetation around you, you've got to be careful about where you go spray those products. Whereas Sharpen and even Permit is not going to walk away as far from a vapor loss. Now you've got to be careful about don't want to spray on a heavy windy day 
and blowing stuff across the fence to your neighbor's garden, you got some problems there. But if you if you and then also spraying that in June, the other thing is to target those two weeds I talked about. It's midsummer is when we need to be spraying herbicides. I have witnessed and have had questions about spraying cockleburr in early August. Is that a good idea? It's about over with. Well, it's almost over with because the plant's going into reproductive phase. It's pretty much done for the year. I'm going to suggest to you, let's just get it mowed and cut down on seed production because it's going to die anyway. Probably the end of this, by the end of this month or by mid-October, it's done. Now, having said that, knowing that something other where you have some perennial weeds in the mix, then what I might recommend that you do instead of spraying that cockleburr or ragweed in mid in June, let's just go ahead and clip it and mow it off in July, and then spray the regrowth first of August if we're going to target other weeds like ironweed, for example. And then try to take care of all of it one time. Now, let's answer questions. Yes, sir. That's sharpening. Is it just a seasonal control or is it a permanent control? Seasonal. And for the most part, all those herbicides are going to take care of that season. So ultimately, yes, I could decide to spray that every year to kill what cockleburr or whatever weeds are there. But unless I have, as long as I've got bare ground going into the spring, I've got more weeds. So the other thing we're doing on these plots is I split them in half and we've interceded some grass. And I'm going to follow this through until next summer and see if there's a difference where we follow up with interceding grass plus the herbicide followed by interceding grass and, and we'll see how it tracks. What's that again? Butyrac 24 dB. Okay. Butyrac 24 dB is a the base molecule is very similar to 24 D, but it is a different molecule. And for all practical purposes, it, we can use it on alfalfa, but there's little value of using it versus regular 24 D in a grazed pasture situation. You get more benefit out of a regular 24D product than you would the Butyrac. You, know, you observed uh, clover loss with all these applications? Some. Some. Now, first of all, this particular field site we're in does not have a very big <laughs> clover stand. All right? So I really don't feel like I have enough there to do an adequate evaluation on that. But let me give you some tidbits of observations. Outside of my treated area for my field study, they did spray the rest of that field with Sharpen. And sure enough, under all of that, there's some clover. I sprayed some of my pastures for 